and welcome to the MCA Services YouTube channel. In this presentation, we're going to be looking at hysteresis in gas sorption isotherms, or more precisely, hysteresis between adsorption and desorption isotherm branches. Here we have two isotherms. The one on the left shows open hysteresis between the adsorption and desorption branches, whereas the one on the right shows desorption branch to follow the adsorption branch, so no hysteresis. In our other gas sorption isotherm presentations, we looked at the various adsorption isotherm types and also the types of desorption hysteresis. And we briefly explained this phenomena and showed when and where it's significant when we interpret isotherms and make links to the classification of pore structure of the sample. In this presentation, we'll look at the origin of isotherm hysteresis in more detail and its influence on interpreting isotherms. Here we have a model isotherm, and as we've shown in our other presentations, this can be classified as a type 4 adsorption isotherm with type H2B hysteresis to the desorption isotherm. Now the first point to note is that discussion of isotherms is heavily dependent on the precise system that we're applying. We will consider nitrogen adsorption isotherms collected at 77 Kelvin, although this can also be applied to other systems. Theoretical and practical approaches to the discussion of gas sorption isotherms tend to revolve around the type 4 isotherm. And as we've already seen, this concerns sample materials that have mesoporosity. So we'll start with the type 4 adsorption isotherm. As adsorption proceeds from point A to point B, the isotherm profile is identical to that of the type 2 isotherm. At a certain pressure, shown here as point B, adsorption volume increases with relative pressure until point C is reached. After this, the isotherm remains flat as saturation is closely approached at point D. As we've seen in our other presentation, it is this flat Gervich plateau that is typical of the type 4 isotherm. The classic type 4 isotherm shows hysteresis between adsorption and desorption branches, and the precise shape of this is dependent on the porous nature of the sample material, and we discuss this in a desorption isotherm presentation. In this example, as relative pressure is reduced during desorption, the isotherm is flat until point E, after which desorption volume decreases until the isotherm closes to the adsorption isotherm at point F. Theoretical approaches to explaining adsorption and desorption isotherms date back over 130 years and can be traced back to the work of Lord Kelvin. Now this really isn't an exhaustive list, but just to give it a little bit of background. In 1888, Van Bemmelen investigated vapour sorption to silica. Later, in 1911, Zygmondy explained adsorption isotherms in a theory based on capillary condensation. And this theory still applies today. It can all be traced back to the work of Lord Kelvin, which established that the equilibrium vapour pressure over a liquid is less than the saturation vapour pressure at the same temperature. And for us, this is absolutely critical, as it allows a gas to condense to a liquid in sample pores at pressures below saturation vapour pressure of the gas. Although we quite often refer to using the Kelvin equation when dealing with assorption isotherms, we actually use a more convenient form in the ostwald feinlich equation, shown here. And in this, P over P0 is the relative pressure, or relative absorption pressure. Gamma is the surface tension of the liquid. VL, the molar volume, R the gas constant, T the temperature, and RM is the radius of the meniscus the meniscus of the liquid condensed in the pores. So essentially, using this, we can equate pore size directly to the radius of a liquid meniscus in a pore at a certain relative pressure absorption. So we can now build on this by considering what happens with certain pore geometries. And we'll start with the simplest, an open-ended cylindrical pore. With pore filling, 
during adsorption, we progress from point A, an empty pore, to point B, where we have a monolayer adsorbed covering the pore walls. Through to point C, this monolayer builds up through multilayer adsorption, and we're effectively observing pore filling via capillary condensation until we reach point D, where the pore is completely filled. Now, this represents an important factor. Capillary condensation starts once the pore already has a monolayer of adsorbed liquid covering the walls. So essentially, this means that the hemispherical radius of the meniscus, that's Rm from our previous equation, is equal to the pore radius less the thickness of the adsorbed layer. So, as we've seen from the last equation, the radius of the liquid adsorbate meniscus is directly related to the relative adsorption pressure. Furthermore, the smaller the pore, the lower the relative pressure required for it to become completely filled. With the appearance of hysteresis between adsorption and desorption isotherms, we're presented with a problem. At a given adsorption volume, we have two relative pressures, one corresponding to the adsorption isotherm, and a lower one corresponding to the desorption isotherm. The result is then to derive two values of Rm, and thus two different pore sizes. So we must revisit the mechanisms of adsorption and desorption, and we'll start by considering this open-ended cylindrical pore. For a pore to be filled by the process of capillary condensation during adsorption, the adsorbate requires a point of nucleation within the pore, and this is the adsorbed monolayer. Given the existence of this monolayer, the pore can then fill from the walls inwards, and this continues until the pore is completely filled. Desorption, via evaporation, on the other hand, doesn't have any requirement on this monolayer. Evaporation can occur spontaneously from any point on the liquid surface. Desorption, or pore emptying, thus occurs from the meniscus downwards until the pore is completely emptied. So essentially, the adsorption and desorption processes occur via two different mechanisms. And what's more, these occur at different relative pressures. Thermodynamic equilibrium, that is to say the existence of a reversible liquid gaseous phase in the pore, and above the pore, is achieved during the desorption process. Pore filling during adsorption is thus seen as being delayed to higher relative pressures. The desorption isotherm is therefore preferred over the adsorption when we try to represent pore size. But this only holds true for the simplest example, the open-ended cylindrical pore where the pore walls act as the nucleation site during the adsorption process. If the open-ended cylindrical pore were to be closed at one end, we're presented with a different situation. The adsorbed monolayer will now be present not only on the walls of the pore, but also covering the base of the pore. Condensation can then commence at the base of the pore, and the pore will be filled by a formation of the meniscus across the pore, and the process continues until the pore is completely filled with adsorbate. Exactly the same applies to V-shaped pores. That is the formation of a meniscus at the base of the pore, followed by a complete filling of the pore. With both of these pore geometries, the adsorption and desorption processes are quite similar, and we would expect to see very little, if any, hysteresis between the isotherms. The closed-ended cylindrical pore, presenting just one pore size, will of course give a near vertical isotherm, whereas the V-shaped pore will show considerably more curvature, as shown here. In these cases, pore size data from adsorption and desorption isotherms should be comparable. The situation gets more complicated as pore geometry diverges from these rather simple systems. The classic example is the ink bottle pore, represented by a comparatively narrow opening, or neck, leading to a larger pore body, or cavity. And the considerations of this can be extended quite easily to alternative pore geometries or networks that show restrictions within them. In the ink bottle pore, filling during adsorption occurs in a manner similar to that of the closed-ended cylindrical pore, 
that is, formation of an adsorbate monolayer. A meniscus can then form at the base of the pore, which progresses up the pore cavity, and it will continue until the pore body and the pore neck are completely filled. On desorption, evaporation must occur from the neck of the pore first, meaning that the pore body remains filled until relative pressure is reduced to the point at which the pore neck is completely emptied. Such a pore system is represented by the type 4 adsorption isotherm with type H2B uh, hysteresis. In an ideal situation, the adsorption isotherm can be used to model the pore body size and the desorption isotherm can be used to model the dimensions of the pore neck. We experience particular problems with the application of desorption isotherms when the pore size is smaller than about 5 nanometers. The desorption isotherms in such systems exhibit a common feature, and that's the closing to meet the adsorption isotherm between 0.45 and 0.5 relative pressure in the case of nitrogen at 77 Kelvin. And that's shown circled here with the H3, H4 and H5 type hysteresis isotherms. Such an effect has been observed for many different samples, just to name a few, silica, zeolites and carbons. It's due to the desorption by evaporation from the poor neck or the poor body involving cavitation, the growth of vapour bubbles. And in these cases, we can derive very little information on pore size from the desorption isotherm, and attempts to model pore size distribution from the desorption isotherm result in a characteristic sharp spike at 3.8 nanometers, in the case of nitrogen at 77 Kelvin. And that's shown on the plots on the right-hand side, the sharp spike being an artifact which also affects the calculations of average pore size and pore volume. The final pore geometry we'll take a look at is the slit-shaped pore, and this is synonymous with graphite and activated carbons. Now Rm is the entire width of the slit between planes of the sample material, and to all intents and purposes this is infinite as far as condensation is concerned. It's analogous to a very large open-ended cylinder. Therefore, as we saw earlier, capillary condensation cannot occur, and instead adsorption occurs at neighbouring surfaces and this continues until they meet. Desorption then occurs through a mechanism of evaporation from the meniscus at all sites around the slit opening. So with the slit shaped pore model, we have an adsorption process occurring via multilayer adsorption and a desorption process occurring via capillary evaporation. Now, of course, layers are unlikely to be evenly spaced, and a geometry involving a degree of irregularity or even pinch points where surfaces touch is perfectly reasonable to assume. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching. Don't forget, we have other presentations on gas adsorption isotherms and also types of desorption hysteresis, and we're adding more videos all the time. I hope you found this useful and there's some further reading on screen if you'd like to take a look at it. Thank you for watching.